music fades and all is stripped away and I simply sure if many of you are familiar with the actual story of this song, so I'm going to tell you about it. Uh, Matt Redman wrote this song, and he was a part of a larger church that started worshiping the music and the people playing the instruments rather than uh, the Most High. And the reason we sing songs is to praise God. And so the leadership found this quite disturbing, and so they decided to make a really big decision and not have music as a part of their services for several months. And so Matt Redman was the worship leader there and a large part of his job was taken away. And so he looked at different ways to pray and different ways to just be silent before the Lord to worship instead of music. And he wrote that song uh, during this time. And so if you read the lyrics in that, uh, with that in mind, in that context, then it, it hits differently. So that first verse again is when the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. So it's not really about the songs that we play, it's about where our heart is at when we are truly coming before the Lord authentically in worship. So as we sing this next song, just keep that in mind. It's build my life and the very first line is worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever pray. Worthy. 
seated. Be seated today. Hey, just so you know, there are some flowers out in there, out there in the foyer for mothers. Uh, that is that is my gift uh, to you guys. Um, and mainly, I have Becky order them because I can remember once to ask Becky to order flowers in perpetuity. That makes sure I never miss getting my wife some flowers. So, um, um, anyways, there you go. You can uh, grab a flower on the way out, please. Also, Cody, hi, and Bethany. She's in the nursery. Hey, you know you have some kids, don't you? You got, what's your first, what's your first kid's name? Manny. Manny, and that's a boy. And your second one? Finley, Finley and that's a boy. boy. And you have another one? Gabriel, Gabriel and that's a, boy. yeah, and your wife's pregnant, right? Yeah. And what are you having? Girl. Hey! There you go, there you go, there you go. Anyways, Cong <laughs> congratulations on that. What? <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> Get used to a whole new way of parenting, buddy. A whole new way. <laughs> Anyways. Anyways. Well, okay, a couple of more announcements for you. First, thank you for helping with VBS and signing up. We were able to fill every slot that we needed. For those of you that were not able to sign up or able to help out that week, just let me remind you that you still have a vitally important mission, which is to be praying. And I know churches like say that all the time because it's like the good Christian thing to say. We, no, we sincerely mean it. Pray. Pray for seeds of the gospel to be planted. Pray for salvation. Pray that this week is the start or a continuation of a life of discipleship towards Christ. So please pray. Please pray. Um, also, Jewel asked that you would sign up today um, for the work day next week. She needs to know so they can prepare food. So sign up. Uh, we want to know so we can make, yeah, so we can get things done and make sure we are uh, preparing well for that. Tim and Charity, you here today? Tim and Charity. Hey, she's in there too? All right. Well, all these good guys in their wife's serving places. Good job. Hey, I wanted to, on behalf of Tim and Charity, I wanted to say thank you. As you know, they're, they're pursuing the adoption process. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. You know, typical adoptions are lower end, about $40,000. With the, from the t-shirt fundraiser and people giving you uh, copious amounts of cash and envelopes, uh, they were able to raise $5,500 towards that. So just praise the Lord and thank you for helping that. Thank you. They are grateful, and it's a really good start on that. Um, also, I wanted to ask you to keep praying for the Heart and House. We know we had them here last week, so as you're praying, just continue to pray that the work of discipleship and freedom from addiction and sin would continue to take place there. And since it's Mother's Day, maybe we can say a prayer that the women that are there who, ha who are mothers can continue to be reunited with their children through the ministry of Heart and House as they become free from addiction, get their lives back on track again. Uh, Chris, listen, would you come up and uh, give us an announcement? Um, are you going to tell us the, the gender of your next baby? No. Oh, okay. Just making, just seeing. <laughs> Rumors and hearsay. <laughs> all right. Uh, this announcement's more for the men of Hopewell. Thank you all gentlemen for coming today. And we're talking about the upcoming June men's ministry event, which will be more of a uh, fellowship event without uh, a lot of work involved. Maybe no more wheelbarrows. Bit, yeah. No, no wheelbarrows for sure. But, uh, we're planning to do a paddling trip on Pigeon River, and so that'll be Saturday, the 3rd of June, planning to start right about 9 a.m. Uh, for a three-hour tour. Um, <laughs> so it's, a, it's roughly a 10-mile paddle, and uh, you have options of either a canoe or a kayak. The canoes are less expensive. You can do two adults and one youth under 70 pounds in a canoe, and that runs 45 bucks or a single rider in a kayak for 38 bucks. The kayaks are a lot faster, they're a lot easier to paddle. So kind of a, you know, decide what you wanna do and who you're bringing kind of a thing as far as which type of paddle craft you would wanna use. So what I'd like to do is have RSVPs by not this coming Monday, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow so that we can lock in uh, how many paddle craft we need. I talked to them yesterday they have lots of paddle craft and plenty of transportation for us, so I don't think we're at any risk of running short, but we do want to get those numbers back to the folks at the Outfitter. Um, we'll send an email out with a lot more detail 
uh, with a link to the outfitter. So if you want to know a little bit more about it, there's also the option to bring your own paddle craft if you want to, and we'll put some details in that email as well. And then finally, if I can get the technology to work, I'll try to get a, an analog sign-up sheet out on the table before the end of the day today, if those of you who uh, prefer to go that route. So email coming, sign-up sheet coming, June 3rd, 9 a.m., be there. Thanks, Chris. And, uh, and, you know, with that, if you just want to email me too to sign up, you can pop open your, or text me, you can pop open your phone right now and just email Ryan, period, K-O-C-H, not K, at hopewellchurch.com. Sorry, that's a little joke about the bulletin. There's a typo there. Uh, Tom, would you come up and be ready to pray for us? As Tom comes up, let me just acknowledge Mother's Day one more time and then give you an idea of expectations for today. Um, first, happy Mother's Day. And we are sincere... Can we get your applause for that? Yeah, and Brad Ryan. Yeah. Um, we're grateful that you're here today and grateful for all the wonderful mothers and grandmothers who play a key part in building families and raising up the next generation. I'm excited to talk about that in a couple weeks. I finished up my sermon uh, when we start talking about the effects of the fall towards men and women. Just grateful for all that women do and the very fact that I wouldn't be here without a mommy. So that's good. Um, but today, if you notice your sermon, we're jumping back into Genesis with a sermon, series, with a sermon entitled Denial and Shame. Now, uh, some people have expectations on Mother's Day to have like a sermon geared specifically towards mothers. Just so you know, our philosophy, or at least my philosophy mainly, um, is to preach through the scriptures and that we don't really deviate that very much, right? I don't, I, like... Most holidays I don't deviate from, Christmas, Easter we do, but when big events happen in the world, we generally don't stop the sermon series to address those. There's pros and cons of that model, but the pro is that, hey, we are committed just to preaching through God's word well and letting him set the agenda for what we need to hear. So just so you have an understanding of today, it isn't going to be a sermon directly geared towards mothers. That doesn't mean we don't value it. We just got good things to get to today in Genesis. With that, would you pray for us, Tom? Thank you, Ryan. Yep. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just are so thankful that uh, we serve a loving God and a loving Father. And, and today, Father, we uh, honor mothers. Mm -hmm. And we thank you for your design of the family. And uh, we just uh, thank you. Well, we live in a country that takes a day and honors our mothers. And, and what a blessing it is to be raised by a godly mother that prays and, and shows her unconditional love. And, and Father, what a, what a high... Uh, honor it is to be a mother and and we just uh, even the adopted mothers that are here and represented we just pray for them and and what a what an act of love that they show and 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 care for a, a child and just so we just uh, lift our mothers up and we thank you for them and we uh, give you praise for them and we uh, and like Ryan says we we uh, pray for the heart and house that uh, those mothers may be reunited with their uh, their children as they uh, get better and heal. So we just uh, lift them up to you and just thank you for this day and thank you for this service and and uh, as we sang in your songs that, that you're worthy of praise. And so that's what we want to do as a church today and just uh, give you praise and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, would you stand and say hi to your neighbor before we jump into the sermon?
All right, Hope Wall Church, if I can bring you back together again. Okay, the last time we were in Genesis, actually, you know what, I'll start off. Daisy Cook gave me a joke. Hey guys, you know, I know it's a tradition today um, to uh, go out to lunch. You know, that's a, that's a normal thing. We're doing that this evening. Guys, can I just give you a piece of advice? Uh, when you go out to lunch, don't let your wife pick where you go. Because the last time a woman picked what to eat, it kind of messed everything up. Thank you, Daisy. Thank you. Thank you. All right, all right. All right. Hey, the last time we were in our Genesis study, we looked at the first human sin. We saw the way that our enemy Satan tempted and influenced Adam and Eve into one of the most event, important events in human history, to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We looked at the serpent. We looked at our responsibility and how it's so easy to twist God's word. And this, again, this was three weeks ago, but our, the core we ended with the core conflict, and I hope this has stuck with you. I hope this refreshes into your mind and into your life that the core conflict that we still face today is between what our eyes see as good and what God says is good. And you and I are going to face that conflict each and every day. What do I see as good, what's appealing to me, and what God says is good. And those things can at times be at conflict, and you have to settle for yourself what I will trust and what I will pursue. Now today, we're going to look at the first results of this choice of sin. And we'll be dealing with topics such as shame and hiding, shifting blame, victim mentality, responsibility, and ultimately our need to turn to God. So happy Mother's Day. And so, and so as you should already be able to see today, our text is powerful and it's relevant. And I think it speaks very significantly into our current time. Not only into our cultural moment, but also in our response to sin and shame as Christians. So here's the first verse we're looking at. Then the eyes of them both, right after they ate, were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed, sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves loincloths. Now their eyes were open for the first time. As we talked about last week and last time, what did they see? They didn't see the beauty of the world. They didn't get new knowledge. They saw their nakedness, and they saw the error of sin. Now, the nakedness itself wasn't a problem. They seemingly had been naked beforehand without issue. So why are they suddenly aware of their nakedness in a way that causes them to hide? This is the idea of sin and shame. What, what happens here is they're projecting now evil onto what was once innocent. And you can see this in Titus 1.15. It said, to the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Both their minds and their consciences have been defiled. So a pure mind can look at a situation and see purity in it. A defiled mind or heart, one that is far from God or unchanged by grace, can look into a pure situation and see what is defiled. You want an example of this? Uh, look at all the guys that crack dirty jokes every time. You know, they get a little snicker because someone said something that was innocent and you read into it about, you know, comments about watching my wife dance. That was you guys. You guys were evil on that one. For those of you who weren't here, I, never mind. I shouldn't have made that joke. All right. Their bodies were a pure and good thing in and of themselves. But when Adam and Eve became evil and unbelieving in their hearts, that twisted their minds so they saw what was pure in a defiled way. And they saw each other in a different way. And now they react to what was once good with shame and flight. Because for the very first time in their transgression against God and in each other, they for the first time had a reason to hide. And something to be embarrassed about. Because the relationship was broken. As one writer said, mistrust and alienation replaced security and intimacy that they had enjoyed. Do you remember the first time your parents like sinned against you? Like, like really sinned against you in a way that hurt? Or maybe it was in a dating relationship where this person, you know, had, you had, they had your trust, they had your respect... You had security there, but all of a sudden they sinned against you. Not one of those like little, eh, I don't really care sins or didn't really affect me sins. But one of the sins that really gets to your heart and wounds you and crushes you and causes you grief. 
those things that strain and possibly break a relationship. And if you think about it, you can remember what that experience was like and here's the kicker. You, you cognitively knew that they were broken people, right? Like you knew, depending on your age, that the world was not right. And yet it still hurt. It still surprised you. It still shocked you when someone that was once you had trust with and unrestricted intimacy with now destroyed something and broke the bridge. And can you imagine what it was like for Adam and Eve to have never experienced the effects of sin at all? And then look at each other and feel that deep-seated wound and pain, but even more so because they had never felt it before. That's what happened in sin. Sin is more serious than what we think. It does more than what we think it will so often. And that relationship is broken, and they try to hide. But they're not actually very good at it. One of the ironies, ironies is they can't hide from God. and They can't even cover themselves very well. God, as we'll see in a few months, will, in his mercy and grace, actually make better clothing for them. And their eyes were open, and what caused them to hide, what their eyes were open to, and what caused them to hide was the unspoken word in this account, which is shame. Shame. We're going to spend a few minutes talking about shame. You see, we often def- refer to shame as something purely negative. As in, you should not have shame, or you should never have shame, or shame is not an appropriate feeling, or maybe that God doesn't want you to have shame. Actually, it's not really true scripturally. Let me show you what I mean by that. You hear in 1 Corinthians 6, this is uh, God talking to the church because they were bringing legal matters before non-Christians, judges, to be, you know, just to help resolve the legal issue. And he says, so if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. That's an interesting word, isn't it? That God assigns shame to them. Now I note this because I don't want there to be a stumbling block between you and God's word and the gospel because you've heard that you should never feel shame or that God never wants you to experience shame. That is, can be a twisting of the gospel. Now stick with me. I know I'm going to be in controversial waters a little bit. We'll get to a resolution that I think that will hopefully encourage you, but stick with me for a few moments. So let's talk about shame. Shame is defined, and there's different, but this is a good one. Um, Shame is defined as fear, pain, or the state of being regarded as unworthy of acceptance in a relationship. So the idea, right, when I'm shamed, when I feel ashamed, I can't be in relationship with you. I want to hide. I'm not worthy of it, or I fear that I'm not worthy of being accepted into a social relationship. Now, many would parse the difference between shame and guilt. And again, there's some helpfulness here, so let me tell you what that looks like. What we often see parsed out as guilt is I did X, I did a thing, and shame is I am X, or I am a thing, right? As one writer said, guilt focuses on the actions or the behavior. Thus, guilt is a person's negative response to wrong actions. Compared to shame, guilt has a more narrow focus. Then shame is the more general and holistic, right? And it's this. It's not that I did a thing, but that I am this. Guilt, I did something. Shame, I did something. And I can appreciate this perspective. But let me remind you what Alexander Solzhenitsyn said so well, that the line between good and evil runs right down the center of the human heart. What this means in part is that sin is really part of my identity. It's really part of who I am. I, I don't, I'm not just a person who overeats. I am a glutton. I'm not just a person who acts pridefully sometimes. I am prideful. I'm not just a person who loses my temper sometimes. I'm, I'm short-tempered. I am more than, you know, my actions show something about my heart and my character. Because on the inside, I am not devoid of those things. I am a lot of those things. You see here in 1 Timothy, my scriptural support for this point is in 1 Timothy. I'm going to go back one slide. Where he says this, 1 Timothy 15. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. What does he say? Of whom I am, not was, am the foremost or worse. He's able to say, I am still a sinner. Not just generically, but specifically. I am a sinner and I sin in these ways. Yet that's not the complete story when it comes to identity, right? And again, we have to understand shame well so we can understand how to resolve it. We go on. Sin is not my complete identity. In fact, I'm given another identity and a more powerful identity. I am a sinner. I am prideful, arrogant, boastful, lustful, a glutton. 
a slanderer of people. I am a sinner saved by grace. I am a child of God, rescued and redeemed. I am made new in Christ, given a new name, born a second time. As 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says it, Do you not know that the righteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Ouch. And such is some, uh, sorry, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I am so grateful for what the gospel declaims that I am simultaneously way worse than I ever imagined and God's grace is bigger than I ever dreamed. And so my point here, or recategorize sin and the subsequent shame. There's an error there. But the other side says, I don't want to ignore sin. And I let my sin become me. It becomes the identity that I cling to. And so I'm, now I'm clinging to the fact that I am a sinner instead of clinging on the fact that I am accepted and given grace in Christ. We need to walk this, this line, this, the road between two ditches as we often use as a metaphor. But let me talk to you about shame. There is shame that comes from personal choice. But there is shame that comes from something outside of your control, isn't there? Personal choice is not the only source of shame. Being sinned against can also be very shameful. Being the victim of things like rape or abuse or for a guy especially losing their job due to something out of your control, those are shameful things. And that kind of shame needs to be addressed very differently. And again, for the sake of succinct, I might be a little too simple here, but how do you address shame that was not due to your choice? By understanding that you're not responsible for, for, for what's done to you. You don't carry the guilt of someone's sin against you. And, and indeed, it is good to remove the shame that is often assigned to people who are guilty of other people's sins. We need to be about that. Shame or guilt over my sin is a healthy response to it. Shame over sin committed against me is an unhealthy response. The, the, all the difference between the truth and a lie. So let's zoom back again and talk about shame in our context. Again, stay with me. We'll get to some payoff here. Hopefully you're getting value as we go through. What I tend to notice, at least in the last 20, 30 years, is that the West and American culture has largely tried to remove shame as a category. We have regarded less and less as shameful. Or we try to handle our shame in isolation, right? I withdraw and hide away from people to resolve my shame. Or I distract from shame, right? The access to media and entertainment and devices means I can always have something to plug into my mind so I don't have to deal with the shame that might be in my heart. Or I will medicate my shame, there is a use for pills. I've been transparent about that before with my Russell with depression in the past. But sometimes we take a pill to resolve something that should be covered by repentance in the gospel. Or sometimes I'll smoke something to give me a false sense of peace. My point is, in the West, we don't really have good means to assign and resolve shame. Now, the ancients were much wiser than we are, at least in this idea of honor and shame, because they were an honor-shame culture. And we still have honor-shame cultures today. And what an honor-shame culture is, is that the, the, the currency of the society, not the currency you use to buy food, but the relational capital that you developed, hinges on acting honorably. Honor and shame culture. If you act honorably, you'll be respected, right? It's why the elders of a lot of these honor shame societies are actually aged as elders, right? They are people on the last seasons of their life. One of the reasons for that is, look, this is a man or a woman who has acted honorably over the long term. They have conducted themselves with honor without shame for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. They are the ones that are worthy of respect and leadership because they have a track record of honor because they're an honor shame culture. We are not an honor shame culture. You are looked up to and given honor in America by what things? Think of the people in our society that get the most honor or respect. If you have wealth, if you have power, if you have good looks, if you have the right connections, if you say the right thing on social media, if you're innovative. And those aren't necessarily bad things, but are they really the things that should increase, increase your esteem before your society? We're not an 
on our shame culture, we are something else. And the value of an honor-shame culture is that it has a lot of clear expectations and rules on how you might act honorably and, how you, and what is shameful and how you resolve shame. So you see people knocking honor-shame cultures because of how they treat sin. And I'm not endorsing every honor-shame culture or every aspect of honor-shame culture. If you read the Gospels, understanding that Jesus is living in an honor-shame culture, you see him at times pushing against and refuting some aspects of the honor-shame culture of his day. But every culture has nobility and corruption to it. I would argue some more and less than others. But honor-shame culture is not bad inherently. It's all about what we see as shameful. And is there a pathway to resolve the shame? Let's talk about assigning shame. Everyone really has things they deem shameful. Even the most shameless movements in our society are quick to assign shame on those that might argue against them. And so we have to keep renewing our minds, church, in the Lord and in his word so that we might correctly understand what is indeed shameful. And we do that based upon God's holiness, based upon his definition of what it means to love, to love a God and to love your neighbor. Those are the things that help us categorize sin. I would argue that many of us don't have a biblical framework for understanding and assigning shame. Let me give you some examples. We would say it is shameful to look at inappropriate things online of a certain nature, but it's not that shameful to neglect hard work to provide for the family. Scripture calls both things sin. It might be shameful to wear certain clothing, but it's not shameful to be disrespectful and subversive to those in authority over you, boss, parents, maybe even a husband's leadership of the home. Both of those things can be sinful, but do we view them that way? It might be shameful to come across as rude or judgmental, but it's not very shameful in our society to be silent as your neighbors pursue self-destruction or they tear apart your community in which you live. Both things biblically are sinful and both things are worthy of shame. I'm just giving you a bunch of other examples, right, of how, wait, what we determine as shameful is often informed more by the world than by the gospel rejuvenating our mind. So we have to focus on the word, church. And on the Lord and asking the Spirit to renew our minds and our conscience so that we can recalibrate our sense of shame. And we need to do this, by the way, not only for ourselves, but also for our neighbor. Again, one of the most, and this, again, controversial, I'm stepping into it. One of the most unloving things you can do for your neighbor is never to assign appropriate shame. Because shame or guilt is the right response to sin in our lives. It is. And if we don't have shame then we never really have a reason to come to the cross to receive God's grace and mercy. So we need a renewed mind so that we might identify and assign shame. And let's get to some of the payoff today. The the idea of resolving shame. Look, I know I'm in dangerous waters here, suggesting that we as a people might actually play a part in assigning shame. That's contentious. I get it. But that's not the end of the message. That's a step on the road. We must be able to accurately assign shame and identify shame so that we can actually resolve it. If you don't get the right illness diagnosis, you can't actually solve it. Shame is a tool. It's a gift given by God to bring the human heart to the point of humility and repentance. He gives it to us. So we might drive us to the cross. And part of our mission, the chief part of our mission as a church, is to come alongside of people, helping them to identify their shame, and then giving them the one and only resolution to the shame. That's the gospel. Let me help you walk out of shame, back into relationship. And what's the key to doing that? It's a truth you've heard a thousand times before. Nothing new here. Maybe a few little twists on it. How do they resolve shame? By confession. The first step to resolving your shame is to say, I have sinned. I have done what is wrong. And not only, now this is a twist, not only individually, but also in community. God has called us to confess our sins to one another. It is not okay for you to always resolve your sin by just you and God. You need to speak it to other people. Resolving shame is not a private thing. It's a communal one because shame has to do with your relationships. Secondly, Confess your sin. Secondly, repent. And we know that the definition of repentance is to turn the other way, right? I'm walking this way in a path of sin. I'm turning and now walking this way. 
Let me add some nuance to that definition. We often say, if I've sinned against you, I've burned the bridge, right? I've broken the bridge. When you're sincerely, sincerely repentant, you say, I broke the bridge, now I'm going to get to work repairing it. As far as it depends on me, I'm going to try to fix what I broke, right what I did wrong. That is a part of repentance. That's part of turning the other way. So confession and repentance. You test the sincerity of a confession and repentance by, are they trying to make restitution for what they did wrong? Now again, with God, we don't have the ability to make full restoration. We get it. This is God's grace to us. But we need to turn back in our relationships. Confession, repentance. And then kick it. Check this. Restoration into right standing with your community. It's why these things are communal. When I sin, I isolate. When I sin, I hide. Shame drives you away from people. Part of the gospel, the resolution of shame is restoration back into the community of which you're now isolated from because of your sin. What a glorious thing to do, church. In the name of Christ, we get to put flesh on the spiritual realities. That's why it's important to do this, right? Because it's hard to resonate and connect with what happens spiritually sometimes. Because I don't see it and feel it with my body in some ways, right? So when I sin, I say, God, I am sorry for my sin. I have, I've done wrong. I can say that to him and I have to remember his words, that you are forgiven. I have to sense in my spirit his peace. But if I say it to my brother James, I say, James, man, I blew it. I sin. He says, in the name of the Lord Jesus, Ryan, you have been forgiven. My ears hear that in a way that my heart might not be able to hear as well. He puts flesh on it. When I have sinned and I run into hiding from God and from people, if I can confess that and be restored into the community, the thing that drove me into hiding and away from my friends, they look at me, my family, my community, say, Dad, you have sinned, but we forgive you and we still love you. And they give me a hug. I had to do that the other day. I lost my temper. I got short-tempered with one of my kids and a disciplinary thing. And I had to confess to him. And he forgave me and he gave me a hug. said, I still love you, Dad. And I'm so grateful. They put flesh on God's forgiveness for me. That is the beautiful thing about the gospel to say your sin that drove you into hiding no longer has to drive you into hiding. Come be a part of the family again. That's the gospel. That's the beauty of God's call to the church. If we can understand shame appropriately, assign it and resolve it. My, uh, one of my sons got to be Billy Graham at school at Lakewood the other day as part of a human wax museum, which I find very dehumanizing um, to all my children. I'm sorry. Hit one of his teachers here. I thought I'd make a joke about it. Now, our, the point is, our, now think about Billy Graham. Now, our, part of his success was that um, there was an inherent sense of shame for a lot of the people or guilt for a lot of the people that he ministered to. Now, I said before, we spent the last 20, 30 years in the Western culture reducing and minimizing shame. I do want to caveat, um, there's some studies coming out now, World News. It's a great Christian-based news website. Go check it out. It's so important for you to get the right, get good sources into your mind when you're trying to think about the world and hear what's going on because of all the spins that happen from every angle. World News had an opinion piece out, and it, it confirms what I've been seeing and reading about some other places, that studies are showing the youngest generations, the, the, the not quite adults yet, parts of us, actually have a deep uh, sense of shame. Like, so, so a lot of the adults in our society, we'll come back to them in a minute, don't have much shame at all. They've been told a lot about shame. That's false. A lot of our youngest people actually have a deep-seated sense of shame because they've been told a lot of things that are actually false, but now they're adding shame. What I mean by that is this is the, some of the results of critical theory that they're guilty of every crime that happens simply by race, by, by basis of their color or their economic standing or the location of the country, right? Like, you are inherently guilty, and I'm not even sure what, right? You are guilty of racism. Well, what did I do that was wrong? And we have a hard time sometimes identifying. They're, look, you can be racist. You can do things that are wrong. But to tie our sin into nebulous things that we can't identify with clarity creates a sense of guilt among our young people that they can't resolve because they don't even know what's really wrong. They just know that people are telling them they're wrong. So that's to say, this, I'm saying, so I'm just trying to help us teach the landscape, right, of what we're looking at when it comes to shame, the younger generations. But let's come back to the adult generations that have been preached a message that you don't need to have shame. A lot of our people are like this, right? Jeremiah 6.15. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No. I love this. They were not ashamed at all. They did not know how to blush. And that's a, that's a very vivid phrase, isn't it? They didn't even know how to blush. 
They don't know how to blush if they've been told that there's nothing to be ashamed of. The result of our cultural relativism or postmodern truth, your truth versus my truth, who are you to tell me that what I did was wrong? There is no sense of right and wrong, whatever we determined it to be. Part of the reason why people don't know how to blush is they have the ability to self, they have the ability to self-select their family and community. What was unthinkable 50 years ago, isolating yourself from your biological family is now increasingly commonplace in our younger generations, especially those apart from the gospel, because your family and your parents are your enemy. And so I get to pick my own community. And when a community forms that's self-selected instead of biological ties, it's homogenized. And it can often be gathered together under the banner of a sin. We are the people that like to smoke together. And I don't know how to blush about it because we all do it together. And pick whatever sin you want to insert into that illustration. There's a lot worse ones, right? There's a lot of things going on like that. We have a lot of people that don't know how to blush. And, it's, and that's really, the, a lot of Christian thinkers that I've been researching is saying it's making evangelism harder in some ways. And you actually have to step it back a stage. Why this ties into Billy Graham. Billy Graham was able to stand up on a stage and say, you are a sinner apart from the Lord Without salvation, you are doomed to hell. And people got it because they knew that they, in their heart, were indeed a sinner. They had a sense of right and wrong. Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Similar sermon. If people don't know how to blush, they don't even know they did wrong, our evangelism for adults might have to start a step earlier and help them to realize that they indeed have shame and things to be shameful for. You might have to help them come to an awareness of how they have fallen short because they may not think they have. Because they've never been taught that there is a right and a wrong and a standard they have fallen below. Just some application for you as you look to apply this into your life. Let me recap the, the bulk of our sermon, what we've covered so far. Adam and Eve, their response to sin was shame and hiding. Now their shame was a useful response, a gift given by God to draw them to repentance. Because they did indeed break the relationship. But their hiding... This is the exact wrong reaction. And what I want you to notice as we come through is God's loving kindness to them hiding in the midst of their shame. Look, there will be consequences for their sin. We shouldn't expect otherwise. Again, that's part of God's goodness and holiness to draw us to the cross and to mercy and grace. But God wants us to draw back into a relationship in the midst of our sin and shame. Not go running and hiding. Look at how he says it here in Hebrews 4.16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. That we, might, that we might receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. In your time of need, draw near to the throne of grace, church. And you see God exampling this for us in Genesis right here. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. We'll get to the last part of this, but I want to stop on this verse for a moment. God walked in the garden, seemingly in the flesh here. God was present. I just want you to sit in a moment and realize that God was present. He walked in the room. Now, God is indeed always present in the spiritual sense. There's nowhere that we go that God is not there, right? The kind of the idea that the sanctuary is holy. God's not here in any way, special way that he isn't when he's not at your home, right? Like he's at your home. He's with you wherever you go. There's something special when the church gathers together for sure, but God is always with you. In the garden, though, something special happens. God manifests himself face to face. Presence, personal connection. God wanted Adam and Eve to be with him. They were not sired and cast off and abandoned as we can be tempted to think with God's visible absence in our time. We were created and loved. And this, by the way, is what we look forward to in heaven when all things are made new again and we live with God in physical proximity and presence. Draw near to God. He's already drawn near to us. And one last note with his walking in the garden. When I was younger, I used to think my spiritual life would be so much easier if Jesus physically walked into the room. Right? If I could just see him, that would just solve all my problems. Um, that's, a, there's a, that's a actually the wrong way of thinking about it. It wouldn't actually help you. See, it didn't work for Adam and Eve. They saw God face to face and still sinned. It didn't help for the, Egypt, for the Israelites or Moses who saw God face to face, who saw the greatest density of supernatural miracles than any generation has ever seen, and yet they still struggled with belief. It didn't help out the disciples who ran away from the cross instead of being there with Jesus in spite of all they saw. Seeing God's physical presence isn't actually going to change your situation really, because it's not about your situation. The problem is not the fact that we don't get to see God face to face. The problem is my wayward heart and my willingness to be deceived and to choose what is wrong. 
And my problem is solved, not if I got the chance to see God manifest, but my problem is solved when I throw myself at the foot of the cross, trusting in God's mercy and grace and in humility, saying, I have sinned and fallen short, and receiving his grace to us. And that takes place in the spiritual realm, and I don't need him to be physically here to receive that. Just a side note for you. But this deep, real, physical proximity relationship with God is something that they sense they weren't worthy of due to their shame, and they hid. And then God goes and seeks them out. And here's we go. But the Lord God called to the man in hiding and said, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who you gave me, to be with me. She gave me the fruit and I ate. And then the Lord said to the woman, what is it that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. What I want you to notice in these verses is first that God seeks them out. Just like how God seeks us out. He hasn't changed what he's been doing. As one writer said, God's first words to a fallen man has all the marks of grace. Let me go back and show it to you. Where are you? That's a question of grace. It is a question, since to help the man he must draw rather than drive him out of hiding. Only a voice penetrates the concealment. Right, the picture here is God comes, and he knows he's in, he's in hiding. He says, where are you at, Adam? And the implication, come on out, come back to me. You know what God doesn't do? He doesn't walk into the bush, grab Adam by the scruff of the neck and drag him out and berate him. What have you done? Get out here. He doesn't do that. He says, Adam, where are you? Come. Let me draw you to myself. He seeks them out. He hunts them down. He finds them. He doesn't leave them to hide and suffer the consequences of their sin and shame. He pursues them. And church, I want to remind you, our God is the same yesterday and today and tomorrow. And he has not stopped or ceased or slowed down on his pursuit of you. I guarantee you, if you stop and think for a moment and reflect that you can hear God's voice calling to you, in your heart or through the word, where are you at, brother? Where are you at, sister? Where are you at, child? God's calling. Because I bet everybody in this room has a way in which they're hiding from the Lord. God pursues and he's physically present. That truth will be of great comfort to some and bring great consternation to others. We can either be comforted by a pursuing God as we see him as the loving father who comes to discipline and to comfort and to help us in our affliction and to resolve our shame and to restore us. Or God pursues me. I want to run. I want to hide because God is not trustworthy. My shame is too great. I don't really want to be found. And I don't really want to let go of the sin that I cling, hold, cling on to. And I just want to remind you of that church. That truth will be of some comfort, will be a comfort to some and consternation to others. Jack said, Yeah, yeah, no, it's all good, it's all good, Sarah. Just be aware of that. And then I want to ask you again I think there's a part of us that wants to continue to run and hide from God. I think if you're honest with yourself, there is probably a part of your heart that has a little bit of worry and consternation that, oh, God pursues me. Oh, God's not going to leave me hiding. Oh, God's not going to leave me in my sin. And so I just want to ask you, as I take a drink of water here, to reflect a little bit and to say, am I hiding from God? Is God's pursuit of me a source of comfort or consternation? See, not only does, do Adam and Eve hide, they shift the blame. When they are found out and they're hiding due to sin and shame, they didn't confess, but they pointed fingers. What I find kind of humorous about this, right? God goes to Adam and says, what did you do? Adam's like, I wasn't hiding because I did anything wrong. They did wrong. Yeah, but then why were you hiding, Adam? Man, we're like little children in that way, aren't we? That what they didn't do was walk the pathway to restoration from shame. They didn't confess and repent. And I just want to remind you, what, what does God do? God doesn't come into the garden and just like drop kick the snake across the garden, right, and blame the snake. God comes and his first words are to Adam. He says, what did you do? So while Satan is real and a true part of life, we don't get to pass the blame to the serpent. Do not ever say the devil made me do it. 
He didn't make you do nothing. And man, he passes the buck to the woman and ultimately to God. God, it's that woman you made for me. She's the problem. You didn't make a good enough woman for me. In reality, Eve is not flawed. In reality, God made someone that Adam was to look out for, to protect, and to shelter. That was his way of serving his God and his wife. And Adam neglected that duty. He stood by, best evidence, passively, while sin was done. Men, it is a good thing for us to take up the mantle to serve, protect, and shelter. That's your responsibility. Well, Adam blames the woman, and, well, the woman blames the snake. That's true, but also incomplete. And again, we don't get to pass the responsibility to Satan. And Eve knew enough of the truth to know that she did was, what she did was wrong. And so Eve, instead of being Adam's partner and helpmate towards creating life and stewarding life, Eve becomes now a partner in crime. Again, we are tempted to shift the blame to our neighbor, to our situation. And let me just say, look, look, I understand our situations and histories affect us. And people do sin against us. But those things do not control my choices and my reaction. This is, again, the fun, one of the fundamental issues in the West, right? We're in a postmodern critical theory mood culture. And by critical theory, right, this is the big issue with critical theory. There's some truth to it, but the big issue is that it, it may, means my color defines me, my economic class defines me, my family of origin defines me, or my genetics defines me, or people, my personality test defines me. And we, can go, and we go on and on finding more and more ways of passing the blame of our own actions to my color, wealth, family, genetics, or personality. Now look, all those things I listed and more do indeed shape you, no doubt. And our situations and the nature of our situations will make some things harder and some things harder. Wait, some things easier, some things harder. We, I understand. I understand that. I understand that. But our situations do not define us and they do not remove God's moral expectations from us. God's moral standards are not graded on a curve. He does take our situations into account, though. Those who are rich ought to take pride in their low positions, James 1, 9. We should honor those in lowly service, 1 Corinthians 12. All right, so that he understands your situations, but his moral expectations don't change. Ultimately, I say that to say we need to accept responsibility for our actions, unlike Adam and Eve. And if we can accept the responsibility for my actions, then I have to deal with the subsequent and good sense of guilt and shame that comes along with that, don't I? So to conclude, what do we do with our shame that results from sin? Do we run and hide? Do we shift the blame? Absolutely not, church. Absolutely not. We take responsibility. And we come humbly before our God, the Father, in community, confessing our sin. God, I have sinned. I have fallen short. I have done what is wrong because my heart is wrong. I am wrong on the inside, not just by my hands, but my heart. My pride is wayward. My mind is wayward. And I beg of your mercy and forgiveness. And then we repent. We turn away from what we did and we work to fix what we broke. And then we as the church get the life-giving honor of being able to extend God's grace and restoration to those who have repented. We get, to, we get to be a part of restoring a life by restoring a sinner into a right relationship. Each and every person here is only here by the grace of God. Each and every person here has something in their present or in their past that should disqualify them from being a part of the church family. Because each and every one of you is a sinner. And I'm certainly not. That was the ironic joke, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. We get to be a part of that by God's grace. And we get to extend that. So don't take responsibility. Don't shift the blame. Draw near to God. And church, this is the way that we actually get to preach the gospel. This is the way that we get to actually restore or re resolve shame. And look, church, this message about shame today and about hiding, it is one you need to hear. Like, I would bank my entire savings account that everybody in this room has something in their life that is causing them some shame today. You need to get that right. Like, do not walk in shame. That affects you. That shapes you. It pushes you into hiding from your neighbor, from your family, and most importantly, from your God. You, you need to hear this today. All right, what do we say? The goal of what? Is not information, but transformation? Right? That's the goal of God's truth. You, you have not had a good Sunday morning. You have not had a good sermon if you just go out and live like you normally do. Don't tell me I liked your message and then just go do what you ever, always did. Like, no. Go resolve the shame that's in your life today. 
Give yourself a moment of quiet and plumb your depths and see what God brings to the surface. Resolve it today. You need this. But more so, you need to hear this and respond more so because your neighbor needs to hear it. Because the people around you either have forgotten how to blush, the people that are far from the Lord, they don't even know how to blush anymore and they need to learn how to blush. Or they are so crushed by their shame that all the things that they are doing that destroys their life and maybe even yours is a result of them running away from their shame. You have to get this. We have to master this idea of assigning and resolving shame. We've got to master it by practice so that we can bring that good news to our neighbor and say, look, I understand. I get it. There is hope for your shame. There's a resolution that's only found in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come, let's enter into that journey together so you can receive mercy and grace. And come, be a part of a family that will look at you and say, yes, I know your sin. I know your garbage. You have confessed it, but we love you anyways because God has loved, loved us while we were still sinners. Your neighbor needs this. This is not just for you. It's for your neighbor. Can we say amen to that? Amen, amen to that. All right. Let me pray. And as you spend uh, some time with your family on Mother's Day weekend, uh, maybe you need to preach that message of uh, assigning and resolving shame. To, yeah? <clears throat> Thanks, James. Yeah, okay. You got my humor there, right? God, we want to come before you and say thank you. Look, I know it's a contentious and it may be even a hard thing to hear, but I do want to say thank you for the gift of shame. Thank you that in my own pride and in my own arrogance and my own waywardness that, that you've still allowed me the ability to, to blush. And that I can't get away with sin without some negative consequence because I need it. So that I can learn wisdom. So I can learn repentance. So I have a need that drives me to the cross. So it's just say thank you. That's a gift of your grace. But Lord, it's a gift, not that we sit in it, Lord. That's the problem. We can't sit in it. We can't have an un, like this vague sense of shame that plagues us and beats us down and drives us into hiding. The point of shame is to drive us to the cross, Lord. And I will say thank you for the gift of mercy and grace and forgiveness. When I understand the weight of my sin, I now understand the bigness of your mercy and grace, the, your, the depths of your love, Lord. And so thank you for that today. And I pray for us as a people that we would resolve our shame. And that we would become masters of helping people to resolve their shame too. God, continue to do. stand as we continue in worship at uh, this time we're also going to be taking offerings so the ushers can go ahead and start passing the baskets um, we introduced this song last week it's called his mercy is more and in lieu of ryan's sermon talking about guilt and shame i'm just i'm so glad that god gives us so much mercy and that we can extend that to other people so as we sing this song just remember that we serve a merciful god
of all the shame that we incur. Amen? And that is something to delight in. That is something to celebrate. And that is a good news to go and share. So today, may you be blessed. And may you share that blessing with your neighbor. Go in peace. Amen. And great, grab a flower on the way out. And maybe an extra donut. Or two. <laughs>